Well, welcome back to our study of 1 Timothy. We left off last week in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to pick up from there today. But let's just go back and kind of refresh our memories of what's going on here. On our very first day together, we laid a, a deep foundation. We wanted to understand Paul, Timothy. We wanted to understand something about the city of Ephesus and the churches there. And so we, we went down deep to build a foundation underneath which our understanding of 1 Timothy would flow, would be more understandable. So once we had done that, we began to look at the different pieces of this letter. The primary reason that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy was that in the churches in Ephesus, there was false teachers who were coming into the city and teaching doctrines that were a little bit off, or in some cases a lot off, from what Paul had taught them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul's main passion is to tell Timothy, Timothy, you must correct these problems that the churches are experiencing chaos, that churches are experiencing disunity because they're trying to follow these different teachings and follow different paths. But with that big idea in mind, he has the opportunity to address a variety of things with Timothy, his friend, his protege, this young man that he called his child in the faith. He, we think that he probably did not introduce Timothy to Christ, but that he was instrumental in the development of Timothy's faith. Timothy had journeyed with Paul uh, for many times and to different places, and now Timothy has been left behind in the city of Ephesus to oversee and manage the churches in that surrounding area. So in addition to the problems with the false teaching, he has an opportunity to express to Timothy some of the basic things he wants him to know. He encouraged him to pray and especially encouraged men to lift up holy hands in prayer, declaring that their relationship with God is good. He, he talked to women and said, please do not be disruptive in our worship services. We are grateful you are here, that you are learning, but please allow us to worship together. So there was some issues of worship that he wanted to address. Then he gave some character qualities for overseers and deacons and just laid out, this is what leaders in the church should be like. So when we left off last time when we were together, he left Timothy with a warning to say, Timothy, listen, in the last days, things are going to get worse. You need to be ready. You need to prepare. You need to be a good follower of Jesus Christ so that you can lead these people into the place where they should go. So with that refreshment in mind, let, let me just step back a little bit and let's use our imaginations. Imagine for a moment that we are Timothy. So let, let's set the scene. It's very early in the morning. The sun is beginning to come up and you're Timothy. You wake up, you roll out of bed, you set your feet on the floor and you go, oh, do I have to get up again? I'm so tired. I wish Paul were here. He gets up, he gets dressed, he walks into the little kitchen where there is some bread and some dried fruit and a little bit of dried meat waiting for him, and he begins to think through his day. He begins to think through his life. He begins to think through all of his struggles. His health is not good and his, his spirit is down, and he, he misses his friend Paul so much. He sits down at the table and he begins to take a bite of food and and maybe a sip of water or, or something to drink. And he says, oh, my stomach doesn't feel well today. But while he sits there at the table, he opens up a parchment. He unrolls it. It's Paul's letter. So imagine that you are Timothy and you're looking for a word of encouragement. And you open up this parchment, which I assume was rolled up much like a scroll. And he begins to read those words. Some of the words bring tears to his eyes. And he begins to cry because he feels so weak and so inadequate. As he continues to read down that, that parchment or that scroll, he sees words that encourage him. He says, my, my brother Paul knows me very well. He knows how to push me. He knows how to love me. He knows how to encourage me. And he sits down with that scroll and he just uses that in his life to say, Paul, I'm not sure that I can. See, Timothy being shy and introverted and insecure is saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Paul, you were the leader. Paul, you were the strong one. I'm weak. And as he reads more, he reads in these words from his, his friend Paul, almost as if to say, 
You can, Timothy, you must, in the strength that Jesus Christ gives you. So when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16 today, we get some of the most personal, some of the most direct uh, admonitions to Timothy that we're going to see in this entire letter. Everything that Paul has said to Timothy so far has been very good advice, but in the verses that we're about to see, Timothy, uh, Paul says to Timothy, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. I was counting in my, in my devotions this morning the number of imperatives or commands just in these few verses, and if I counted right, there were ten. A command is something where you say, you must go to the store, you will clean your room, you, should, you must read your Bible. Those are commands, and in these few verses there are ten of them. What I'd like to do in this section is take the ten and not list every one, but kind of group them into five things that become the mark of a Christian servant. You might group them different in your study, but I've chosen to take, excuse me, four of them, four marks of a Christian servant that Timothy is instructed to from Paul. So take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, it says this, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. Persist in this, for, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, as you read that, or as you heard that, did you see the specific instructions, the specific commands? Timothy, you must do this. Timothy, you must do this. Well, let me take that first grouping of commands and put it into this statement. The first mark of a Christian servant is that he or she has integrity. The word integrity is not in these verses, but it's one in which I put verses 11 and 12 together, and it looks to me like integrity. Now, let me explain what the word integrity means. It means soundness or wholeness. If any of you have ever been on a ship before, talk about the integrity of the ship's hull, it means that there are no cracks in it. There is no way for water to leak in. That, that hull of that ship has integrity. Or if you've ever flown in an airplane, I, I flew in an airplane to come here to Russia. If the fuselage of the airplane has integrity, it means there are no holes, there are no cracks, because if there were holes or cracks, it would, it would get into the airplane and the airplane would break apart. So when Paul says to Timothy, I want you as a Christian servant to have a life that has integrity, he's saying, I want it to be whole, I want it to be complete, and he expresses it in these first two commands. He says, I want you to command and teach these things. Timothy, I don't want you to be shy. When you're in these churches and when you're talking to these people, you must tell them what to do. You must tell them what to believe. Remember our little phrase from last times, the, the several times we were together? Uh, belief drives behavior. Timothy, tell them what to believe. Tell them what the gospel says. Tell them what the scriptures say, how they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He says, I want you to teach these things. That's what you were gifted to do. In fact, he follows that up in verse 12 with another of his commands, but it still fits in this idea of integrity when he says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. Now, we're not sure how old Timothy is right now. Some speculate that he's about 35, that he has, and in the Jewish culture, when you were 30 years old, you fully became a man. So we guess that he's somewhere near the age of 30. So we're saying maybe 35, maybe 32. But he's young enough that when he's in these churches, they look at him and say, well, you're too young to be a leader. How can you possibly know the answers for our church? We have been here for a long time. Our city is old. 
Our churches, while they may be new, but Paul, we respected Paul, but he's an older man. But you, and Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, don't let them look down on you because of your youth. And let me use that as encouragement for those of you who are younger and wanting to serve in churches. Just because you're young doesn't mean that God can't use you. But what that means is the same thing that Paul tells Timothy here. He says, because you are young, you're going to have to set an example in the way you talk, in the way you live, in the way you love, in your faith, and in your purity. Hey, Timothy, you are not going to convince them with your words, but they're going to look at your life and they're going to say, ah, I can't find fault with him. Remember our phrase again, belief drives behavior. But if you want to find out what someone believes, you look at their behavior. Say, so Timothy, if they look at you and how you live and how you behave, and it's consistent with the gospel, it's consistent with a, a spiritually mature young man, then they will be willing to listen to what you believe. Belief drives behavior, but they're watching your behavior so that they can trust and find out what to believe. And I like the things that he encourages him to do. He says, in your speech, Timothy, when you talk, it's not only the words that you say, it's how you say them. Does your tongue ever get you in trouble? It gets me in trouble. Sometimes it's the words that I say that I, as soon as I say it, I go, ah, why did I say that? Something I say to my wife or something I say to my children or, or little Sasha has made me upset and I say, Sasha, go to your room. It was right that I sent her to her room because she did something wrong, but the tone of my voice was harsh and critical. Sometimes the people in my church, I, I, I try to be a good leader and a good pastor, and sometimes I get so frustrated that inside I have to just bite my tongue so that I don't say these things, because if I say things in a wrong way, I then become a distraction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, Timothy, in your church, you have people arguing, you have people debating over all these kinds of issues, but when you talk, make sure that your speech is a reflection of the life of Jesus Christ in you. If they can't discredit your personal life, then they can't discredit the things that you're trying to teach. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. The second thing he talks about, he says, I want you to have this integrity. He says, an example in speech and in conduct. Not just what you say, but how you live. So as Timothy would go into the marketplace and perhaps he would buy some groceries or maybe he would buy a new tunic and, and people watched him in the community. They were watching him to see if there was any lack of integrity in his life. He says, Timothy, I want you to make sure that your life is lived with integrity. He says, in your love. Boy, if there's anything we can find fault with people is, is, is how that they love. And sometimes people look at me and say, Pastor Bruce, it doesn't feel like you love me. It doesn't feel like you care about me. It feels like you're just trying to tell me what to do. And, and sometimes I have to confess and say, you're right. Sometimes we can do the right thing, but with a lack of love. And when we have a lack of love, the message itself gets discredited. Timothy, watch your heart. The love of Jesus Christ must flow through you as it is in you. He said, Timothy, also in your faith in your ability to trust, in your ability to, to believe, Timothy, they're going to watch you. Timothy, if you tell them to trust, if you tell them to believe, but you show because of all your insecurities that you don't trust and you don't believe, then they're not going to believe the things you say. But he says, Timothy, in your purity, be careful. See, this is one of those reasons where we go back to the foundation that we laid. Remember us talking about the, the temple of Artemis, the temple of Diana? I was doing a little bit more research this past weekend on that temple, and, and the goddess Diana is portrayed as a woman with many breasts. 
And it, the, the statue that I saw had like 20 or 30 breasts. And it was, it was a, symbol, a symbol for fertility or sexuality. The thought is that in this temple or around this temple, there was actually prostitution going on in the name of this goddess. That if you want to be in relationship with the goddess Diana, you will have this sexual experience. So the assumption that I make is that there was promiscuity and that there was um, uh, physical temptations regarding women in that particular culture. So if Timothy is a young man and he's not married, and we believe that he wasn't married, we don't really know, Timothy, you must watch your eyes and what they see. Timothy, and other writers in the Bible talk about the eyes being the gateway to the mind. And when an image is played out in our mind, it works its way into our heart. That's exactly what happened to King David back in the Old Testament. He saw Bathsheba, and then he began to think, and he said, I must have her. And he said, go get her for me. And they said, King David, we can't do that. He says, go get her. Then that led to a, a, a defection of his heart where he led, was led into sin. And so Paul is absolutely right in telling Timothy, this young man who could fall prey to these, these visual and physical temptations, Timothy, you must watch what you see and the gateway of, of your eyes to your purity. So all of that is under the umbrella. If I want to be a godly servant, man or woman, one of the qualities that I need in my life is simply integrity, wholeness, completeness. He isn't arguing for perfection. It would be nice if we could be perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. None of us ever will be. We are being sanctified every day, day after day after day. He says, but there can be an integrity. There can be a wholeness in our lives as we follow Christ. So that's the first one, integrity. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.